Good evening, everybody. My name is Nina Vigilardia, welcoming all of you to the Together Facing Neuroendocrine Tumors event here at the Fox Chase Cancer Center. We're doing it virtually. I would like to thank the patients, caregivers, advocates, and guests who are joining us this evening. As I said, my name is Nina Vigilardia. I am an Assistant Chief of GI Medical Oncology here at Fox Chase Cancer Center, and it's my pleasure to host all of you and on an evening where we're going to learn more about neuroendocrine tumors. Tonight, I and my colleagues here are going to share with you the latest research and the treatment developments for neuroendocrine tumors. Throughout the program, please feel free to leave questions in the chat feature on Facebook, and we'll probably get to them at the end of the evening. Before we continue, I do want to take a moment to honor those who we have lost to cancer. Please join with me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Also, I would like to thank our exhibitors for the evening. It is because of their generous support that we could host a program today. Our gold exhibitors are Caris, Foundation Medicine, and Tempest. And our silver exhibitors include Curium, ITM, Matera, and Olympus. Also, I would like to extend a special thank you to our very strong patient advocacy groups, the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation, and also the Philly Nets organization. We really appreciate your partnership in helping us empower patients for, with suffering from neuroendocrine tumors. Now, let me take a moment to introduce our panel. We have with us today all the bright minds of neuroendocrine tumors here at Fox Chase in alphabetical order. First up is Dr. Sarah Abdullah. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Clinical Radiology at the Temple University and Fox Chase Cancer Center. Dr. Christian Couch, who is the director of the Division of Endocrinology and a professor in the Department of Medicine at Fox Chase Cancer Center. Dr. Sanjay Reddy, who's the associate professor in the Department of Surgical Oncology and the co-director of the Marvin and Conchetta Greenberg Pancreatic Cancer Institute. We have myself, Nina Vijayvargia. I'm the assistant chief in the Division of GI Medical Oncology and an associate professor in the Department of Hematology and Oncology. Dr. Michael Yu, who is the chief of the Nuclear Medicine and Pet Department and professor in the Department of Radiology at Fox, at Fox Chase Cancer Center in Temple. Then we have Anjali Albanese, who is our medical social worker who, um, takes, uh, who is involved with all our GI cancer patients. And last but not the least, I want to introduce Karen Chiha, who is our program coordinator for our peptide receptor radiotherapy, or as we're gonna call it, the PRRT program here. Thank you everybody for joining and making this program a success. So today we're gonna talk a little bit about neuroendocrine tumors. I thought I'd go, I'd start first. My job um, and the, is mainly to share what I think is very important to know about neuroendocrine tumor. So I'm gonna call it NET primer or a NET 101. Um, as you know, we are concluding the, the neuroendocrine cancer awareness month, it was in November and now we're just concluding it. So it's perfect timing to wrap up the entire month and talk about the disease. Um, I think the most important thing with neuroendocrine tumors is a lot of you may know, but some may not, it is a rare cancer because the incidence is about seven per 100,000 people per year. But despite its rare occurrence, it is a more prevalent cancer because there are many patients, about 150,000 people in America living with this disease. And even though it's a rare cancer, there was very limited development in the treatment options for this disease from the 1980s to even up to 2008 or nine. And then in the last 10 years, 
we've had more than seven new FDA approvals for new drugs and treatment options for this disease. So the future is bright and, we're, and our research is not ending and we're just getting more and more excited about how we can um, take care of our patients better. But it, in the process of doing so, one of the most important thing is to educate patients of what they should be looking for you know, in this disease. So just a little bit of history, it was misnomerly called a carcinoid when it was initially coined in 1907 by a German pathologist, Dr. Oberndorfer. And it, because it doesn't, it's not cancer-like, which is the meaning of carcinoid. It is cancer, just cancer in slower motion is how we call it. It is, um, there are a few things that help us determine how to best treat the patient. And as a patient, you should know about your cancer or try to know from your doctor. You know, one of them is, the most important one is whether the tumor is functional or non-functional. We hear a lot of these tumors produce hormones and are, is your tumor functional, making hormones and producing symptoms, whether it be it carcinoid syndrome with the flushing and diarrhea or the hormones that are secreted by a slew of these tumors causing a lot of diseases for which Dr. Coach is going to talk about a little later. We need to know about the extent of the disease. You know, is it just a single tumor? What is, uh, or it's metastatic, which means it's spread to other organs. Which organs? Is it only liver or some other places? Because that also determines how best your cancer will be treated. You also may want to know about where the primary site is. You know, carcinoid arising in the small intestine is different from that arising in the lung. And a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor is a totally different thing. It's, that's why it's very important to know where it all started. The other important distinction is the grade of the neuroendocrine tumor, or we call it, you know, what, how quickly these cells are dividing. And we have divided into grade one, two, and three, and even the grade three is well differentiated, poorly differentiated, and that's just based on how quickly cells divide and how aggressive the cancer is going to be, because our treatment will be tailored to that. And finally, one of the important things you need to know is, does your tumor express the somatostatin receptor, which most, about 80 to 90 percent of at least the well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors do, and that is measured by special tests that we're going to talk about later during the course of it. So all of this, you know, once you know, we are a lot of these treatment options, whether you do different types of treatments or you combine them all in different sequence, and all of these things can only be done in a multidisciplinary fashion. And uh, for that, you need to be in a center who does that kind of treatment. So here I'm going to stop. So now you know what you need to know about NETS. From here, I'm going to uh, invite Dr. Reddy to talk, give you a primer of what um, surgical things you need to know about. Thanks, Nina. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sanjay Reddy. Um, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Surgery, uh, program, associate program director for our fellowship, and also one of the co-directors for the Conchetta Greenberg Pancreatic Cancer Institute. I want to spend the next few minutes just talking a little bit about neuroendocrine tumors. And I think one of the keys we need to understand is that this disease really demands attention from multiple disciplines, right? This includes med -onc, radiation oncology, interventional GI, interventional radiology, nuclear medicine, pretty much all the, the folks you see on the, on the call this evening. And the foundation of this disease is really, again, focused on multidisciplinary care. And I can't emphasize enough how important that is when we care for patients with this disease. Again, a little bit of a brief history. Our institution has, been a long, has had a longstanding tradition of treating this, this rare disease. And this groundbreaking work, I, I have to just say, was really driven by a mentor to all of us, Paul Engstrom, um, who was really just emphatic about you know, collaborative discussions across these disciplines when we're treating this type of cancer. We're gonna hear from a lot of different, uh, different um, specialties today. And I'd like to briefly just mention a little bit about from the surgical perspective, what and how things have changed over the years. We've made a lot, a lot of advancements in, in, in this time frame, and the true surgical enigma with this disease is that it affects so many different organs, right? We just talked about pancreas, small bowel, liver, and I think each of these sites of disease really renders a different operation and skill set. So this is where coming to a center where you have a true team, um, specifically in, in my field, surgical oncologists that navigate these areas appropriately. The tough thing is that these tumors come in all shapes and sizes, 
And you'll hear this role for surgical debulking, right? So what is debulking? It's essentially a way that we remove as much of the disease as possible. And this has been surgical dogma for years when we talk about you know, neuroendocrine tumors. And when someone hears the fact that their disease may be metastatic or spread to other areas, this disease in particular is very unique in that even though it may be metastatic, surgery can still play a pivotal role. Whereas in many other cancers, when you hear a situation where you're metastatic, by and large, that dictates that surgery is no longer an option. So the other area is that with improved imaging studies, like the net PET scan, which Dr. Yu will talk about shortly, we've been able to target specific tumors for surgical resection. I mean, this test really simply put, injects a tracer, uh, and then there's the somatostatin receptors that Dr. VJ just speak, spoke about, and it uptakes on the imaging, and then we're able to target, usually with surgery, where to go. Um, this really allows, again, for better surgical techniques to take out these, these tumors. I think this modality of testing has been a game changer for neuroendocrine tumors because it really allows the surgeon to identify not only the area of disease that we know is there, but also disease that could be distant from the primary. And if so, we can address all of this at the index operation. We also utilize interventional GI uh, quite extensively in these, um, in, in these cases because, again, the small bowel is long. And a lot of the times the GI guys can go in there and scope endoscopically and help find where the tumors are located. So when I do an operation, we could do a lot of this with laparoscopy and small incisions. Because the traditional sense is that in an open operation, that's the best way we can palpate, touch, and feel log segments of bowel. Whereas now we try to do things laparoscopically and we rely on the tattoos that our GI colleagues place to help identify areas of concern. To touch on that a little bit more, I really think over the years, the utilization of minimally invasive surgery for um, neuroendocrine tumors has gained a lot of momentum. Um, this really offsets some of the surgical morbidity we see with these operations. We've utilized not only laparoscopy, but the DaVinci robotic platform to perform a lot of these operations. And as this technology develops, it offers certain criteria, precision with dissection, visualization, smaller incisions, and quicker recovery. So I'll talk specifically about pancreas in general. We've been able to offer patients um, more um, enucleations of these small pancreatic tumors with the goal of preserving the parenchyma, where we don't have to resect actual sections of the pancreas, but essentially enucleate or scoop out the tumors. Um, for tumors that are localized in the body and tail, through the robotic platform, we're actually able to save the veins and arteries that um, you know, provide uh, supply to the spleen. This is called a splenic preserving pancreatectomy. Um, again, this is really important stuff when we talk about um, surgical, uh, the way sur surgery has evolved over the years. What we've also learned over the years is that in this disease, it's again, not driven by a sole specialty. And I can't emphasize that enough. It's a combination of the team, okay. right? With specific skill sets. Um, while we continue to make surgical advancements with less invasive surgery, the backbone remains uh, embracing multidisciplinary care. Um, we're in the era now of precision medicine, right? And I think this disease space is one that truly embodies this concept. And I'm really humbled to be alongside these experts on the panel today um, who tackle this disease day in and day out. Um, so again, from the surgical perspective, we've made a lot of advancements over the years. Um, and I hope that we'll continue to do so. Thank you so much, Dr. Reddy. Appreciate your quick insight. Next, I would request Dr. Sarah Abdullah to share her thoughts. Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Sarah Abdullah. I'm an interventional radiologist at Fox Chase. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what interventional radiology has to offer for neuroendocrine tumors. Um, we're involved both in the diagnosis, so early on when you're first um, working up and trying to figure out what's going on. A lot of times interventional radiologists will do the biopsy portion of that, which we use image guidance, CT or ultrasound to guide a tiny little needle 
into the tumors precisely and sampling that um, in order to figure out what's going on and get a diagnosis. Um, we're also involved a lot with the treatment as well. Um, in patients who have neuroendocrine tumors that are in the liver, we offer targeted personalized liver directed treatments. Um, and there's really two big categories for these treatments. Um, one of them is embolization um, and one of them is ablation. So embolization is basically shutting the blood supply to the tumors. And the way we do that is we take advantage of the liver being a very unique organ, um, having two blood supplies, um, the ar artery supplying the liver and also a vein supplying the liver. So it turns out the arteries supply the majority of the tumor blood supply. So by getting um, into the arteries, we use tiny little um, pinhole um, incisions to guide a catheter into the arteries in the liver. Um, we map out the arteries supplying the tumors um, and then basically shut off the blood supply to the tumors. Um, and we use ultrasound and x-ray guidance during these procedures um, to do them very precisely and safely. Um, patients can be awake during these procedures when we're treating the tumors in the liver. Um, we use a light sedation. A lot of times patients are even watching the treatment as it's happening um, since it's not painful at all while we're doing it. Um, and patients who have symptoms from their, um, their liver tumors, um, they could actually help with the symptoms. Um, when we treat them. And there's a different types of embolization procedures that we do. So um, bland embolization is just really cutting off the blood supply with the goal of um, <clears throat> you know, decreasing the size of the tumor, stopping its growth. Um, if it's secreting hormones and causing symptoms, it could also help with that. Um, we also can do radio embolization, which is um, along with cutting off the blood supply, also providing a radiation treatment for the tumors as well. Um, as far as the recovery from this procedure, most patients um, stay in the hospital for one night. Um, the procedure can cause some discomfort, um, usually mild and well tolerated. Um, and then um, patients recover fairly well from the procedure. Um, the other type of treatment that interventional radiologists are involved with frequently is um, ablation. And this is different. Um, I usually explain it that embolization is treating the tumor from the outside in, treating the blood supply. Um, ablation is more treating from the middle out. So similar to a biopsy, we actually guide a needle into the tumor precisely and using heat or sometimes cold in some cases, um, basically burn the tumor to try to kill it and um, stop it from growing. Um, and we also use ultrasound and CAT scan guidance for those procedures in order to do them very precisely and monitor the treatment, make sure it's um, being performed adequately. Um, and these are frequently same day procedures for patients. So come in, in the morning, get the procedure done, leave that afternoon as long as um, they feel, everybody, a um, patient feels fine. Um, it's not uncommon that we do a combination of treatments. So some patients, um, everything's very personalized depending on, on what's going on with the patient. So um, sometimes patients need both embolization and ablation. Um, and the good thing about these treatments is as long as the liver function remains good, um, they're repeatable. So if anything changes, we can always repeat the treatment and we see patients and treat them over the course of years um, in, in our department. So. Um, that's just the general um, overview of what we have to offer. Thank you so much, Dr. Abdullah. Next, I'm, I'm going to invite Dr. Michael Yu to talk about nuclear medicine. Hi, um, my name is Michael Yu. I'm the chief of nuclear medicine in Bob Chase Cancer Center and also the system chief for the Temple Health System for nuclear medicine and the PET. Um, so we already talked about the new endocrine tumor is a rare disease, and but it's a complex disease. We really need to have a multiple uh, disciplinary team, and then we have a lot of experts here, and I'm glad to be part of the team. So I work in radiology department, but I'm doing functional imaging. So the radiology, you usually use uh, CT, ultrasound, and MRI for the structure. Nuclear medicine, usually we do functional imaging. 
we do have a new endocrine specific tracer approved by FDA in about 1994. At that time, you know, we usually only do uh, planar images, which we take picture from the front, back, and the sideways. Um, the quality is not ideal. And then several years later, we start to have had CT, but there are no specific tracer at that time. Another several years down the road, we have a spec CT, which is a newer technology. So we can take a picture with the three dimensional uh, scans. So we see inside of the body, we see better. So usually the newer technology can make things uh, clear, you know, makes the invisible visible. The most exciting thing happened is 2016, we start to have a PET tracer specific for neuroendocrine tumor, you know, we call the PET scan. It's a gallium uh, labeled somatostatin receptor. So we can use that for initial staging. So we see patient pre-treatment, we can identify the primary site. We can identify the metastasis, just see where the tumor is in the lymph node or really everywhere, everywhere in the body. And then we can, you know, follow the treatment. And I think everybody heard about the term uh, serenostics. Basically, we use a compound labeled with radio tracers so we can see where the tumor is. And then we label with another tracer and we can treat it. So the concept is basically we see what we treat and we treat what we see. And the treatment approved by FDA was in 2018. It's called a PRRT. So the full name is the peptide uh, receptor radionuclide therapy. So we usually do the net scan before the treatment to select somatostatin receptor avid tumor. And then we give the lutathera and to treat the, all the tumors, the tracer will go to the same place. There are radiation involved. We always follow the NRC, which is Nuclear Regulatory Commission guidelines. We talk to the patient before and make sure they are qualified for the treatment and then make sure they are, you know, within the limit. And then during the treatment, we always monitor the patient and make sure they are okay to be released to home. We usually give patients radiation precautions so they can take home, you know, they can follow the guidelines, they can lower the exposure to themselves and the patient and the family. And the treatment we do with the PRRT in clinical trials has been really better than the drug trial compared to that at the time, the drug trial has response about 3% to 6%, and then the treatment has about 18%. And then the progression free survival is much longer. So we are very happy to have this one. And then actually Fox Chase is the first one to all to offer this treatment in the city. And we also participate in the you know, extended access program. So if you have neuroendocrine tumor, we definitely suggest you will go to a center to know what they are doing, to have the place, have the best technology, has expertise, and also have the proficiency. Because sometimes people ask me, we only have several patients, we want to set up the program. I said, if you only have several, send to us. And then Dr. Vijay and our group usually do uh, research studies. We are always on the leading edge. We can bring in the new technology and the new compound for the service and for patient. So the new technology can make the unclear clear and then the invisible visible. And then the leading edge, you can have a early access and that will be good, you know, for the tumor journey. I think that's all I have. And Karen will talk more about the details of the PRRT. Thank you, Dr. Yu. Karen, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Hello everyone, my name is Karen Sheehan and my role is the PRR 
PRRT treatment program coordinator. I work with an outstanding team each time we treat a net patient. My interaction with the patient begins after they sign the consent in the clinic area. And together we sit down and we look at the next available dates for the four treatments. Uh, there are actually four infusions and each uh, of them are eight weeks apart. So we need to be mindful of the national holidays because there are uh, no deliveries of the radioactive drug. And also um, we have to look at uh, religious holidays that the patient may celebrate and maybe even a special occasion that they have coming up such as a wedding. I review also with them what the treatment day will look like and answer any questions that they have. Then I'll coordinate a consult with Dr. Yu and he'll review their most recent scan results and also go over the risks and benefits of the PRRT treatment. We also have a member of the radiation safety staff and they will review the precautions as Dr. Yu mentioned that they need to follow when they're released to go home. We can do this either in person, which is preferred of course, but we also can do this virtually. Each week I send a notification to the treatment team to let them know about the upcoming patients so that they can plan for staff availability I make sure the orders are signed and that the drug is ordered at least two weeks in advance of the treatment. Each month I no uh, notify the new patient office to let them know of the dates of the treatment patients and they will schedule the blood work and the infusion for the morning of the treatment. On the day before the treatment, I call the patients and I remind them that they don't have to fast for this they can start hydrating and I'll answer any last minute questions they have some, you know, thing like, uh, what should I wear that day? I let them know that in order to recognize me, I will uh, meet them by the snack bar, but I'll be wearing this, um, I'll show you here, this daisy pin, that's how they identify me. And it helps especially with the masking requirements. Then on the morning of their treatment, I meet them at either eight or nine o'clock and we go to the radiation oncology department and they check in. And this is where the two treatments are located, two treatment rooms are located. Um, they'll be greeted by the treatment day nurse and she takes their vitals, their pre and post treatment blood work. She administers the IV infusion and monitors the patient and she'll even go and get the patient a soft pretzel if they want one. There's two separate treatment rooms. They have a lounge chair, a television, a locker, and best of all, they have their own private bathroom. They can bring their cell phone, iPad, a book, snacks, drinks, and some of our patients take a snooze because they get up early to get to the, uh, to get Fox Chase on time, and some of them live quite a distance from the hospital. Radiation safety staff has already prepared the room to prevent radioactive contamination, and they monitor the patient's radiation levels to assure that they can be released safely with instructions. They'll also give the patient a wallet card to carry and that will put, have the date of their treatment and also the radioactive material that they received. The treatment lasts about five or six hours and the reason why it takes so long is because we infuse an amino acid which helps protect the kidneys from the radiation. A second IV is used to administer the radioactive drug by nuclear medicine staff, and this is removed after the infusion is completed. At some point during their treatment, I provide them with their upcoming schedule, and that includes one month follow-up blood work and clinic appointment, the dates of their next PRRT treatment, and I answer any questions, and also I will uh, give them my contact information. 
both Dr. Yu and myself will stop by during the treatment to answer any other questions. And I just want to say that I love what I do. Uh, my hope is that I uh, make the patients feel less anxious by providing them with enough information and a familiar contact that they can call with any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Karen. Uh, she, definitely, you are one of the most important members of our <laughs> program, so appreciate your help. Um, Thank you. Now I'm going to invite Dr. Cook to talk about the enigma of the hormonal secretions and, and how we handle them, because that is a very important part of managing these cancers. Well, thank you. So my name is Christian Cook. Hello, everybody. And I'm the chief of endocrinology at Fox Chase Cancer Center. And I see my role as, um, you know, assisting this multi-specialty group in better diagnosing and treating these tumors. Um, because neuroendocrine tumors, if you include the pituitary gland, can really occur from head to toe. Uh, I say toe because if they're in the skin and it's a Merkel cell tumor, that's also a neuroendocrine tumor which rarely can secrete ACTH, which then stimulates the adrenal glands for making cortisol. And as a patient, <clears throat> you might uh, gain weight and develop hypertension that is all related to cortisol excess. And that is basically my role to come in and um, either find a hormone over secretion in a patient who presents with any type of nodule whether it's in the pituitary, whether it's in the adrenal gland and the thyroid gland, and then find out um, how we can um, help this, uh, this patient. So for instance, if you came with flushing, um, you might have, and hypertension, you might have an adrenal pheochromocytoma, basically a neuroendocrine tumor that over-secretes catecholamines and thereby then, um, you know, can become deadly if you, uh, you know, develop extremely high blood pressure or a heart attack or a stroke. And we can um, assess the, these type of tumors by measuring plasma-free metanephrines. But there's many other hormones we, we, could, we could measure. Um, when the uh, presentation is a thyroid nodule, we would look into those um, and it could be a calcitonin producing neuroendocrine tumor called a medullary thyroid carcinoma, which is rare, but is uh, occurring. Then patients could be referred from uh, Dr. Nina, for instance, when they, be, uh, they have recurrent hypoglycemia. And the um, low glucoses, which are very unpleasant to the patient, if you have to eat like every hour, every two hours, could be caused by an over-secretion of insulin, a hormone that can come uh, most of the time from the pancreas. Um, but like I said, I mean, you know, the, the tissues and depending on the differentiation status um, of, of any type could, could really um, excessively make, make hormones. So we talked about the adrenal gland and uh, endocrine hypertension from a neuroendocrine tumor, such as a pheochromocytoma, but it could also be located extra adrenally. And then it's called a paraganglioma. Uh, we still use our uh, hormone evaluation as diagnostic tool. And then with the help of nuclear medicine and conventional imaging studies, we can uh, hopefully, um, you know, localize um, this, uh, you know, tumor and treat it accordingly, either surgically or with nuclear medicine or medically, or sometimes don't uh, do anything, just observe it if it's not causing a whole lot of symptoms and surgery would be maybe too risky. Um, another way how such patients could present is, and that's what we are looking into, um, high calcium just on a normal health examination, in which case the question would become, is this, could this be from a neuroendocrine tumor? And um, you know, what could be done. Um, there's a variety of hormones I now don't want to go into now too much, but I mean, one is called parathyroid hormone-related peptide. And um, this, uh, similar to parathyroid hormone itself, can cause a high calcium in the blood. That is a rare problem. So it's probably more common to have gastric ulcers 
And if that is hard to treat, it might be from a neuroendocrine tumor in the duodenum called a gastrinoma. The hormone is gastrin. Uh, so there's many such um, syndromes. And what's, what's interesting about it, it doesn't have to be just one um, neuroendocrine tumor, but it can be associated with many others uh, in a syndromic fashion. And we, mm, I would say, over the last 20 years have recently discovered more such syndromic uh, tumors, be it uh, multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1 at that time in the 90s when the gene was cloned and we have multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2, then we have multiple endocrine neoplasia type 4 now. And there's more <clears throat> since uh, with the help of genetic studies, we um, identify um, more genes that are responsible for causing uh, tumors, including neuroendocrine tumors uh, in multiple locations. There's also von Hippel-Lindau syndrome which can cause pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Um, and that's basically how I see my role um, and would like to bring endocrinology into um, the awareness to say, well, there's various hormones that can be secreted. Some have very difficult names, um, but they can have, um, or they can cause a clinical problem. And many times, if you don't ask the right questions, when the patient presents with an incidental nodule or um, with, with uh, symptoms that are not easily uh, attributed to a, a syndrome, then you will never really um, detect a neuroendocrine tumor. Um, as, as, as one difficult example, for instance, is this group of um, ileal or jejuno ileal neuroendocrine tumors now, when it comes to Cushing syndrome, I mean, I'm working on patients with Cushing syndrome for many years since I was at the NIH, and I can say that sometimes an ectopic um, um, hormone producing tumor that is in millimeter size is very difficult to find. So often they might present with metastases at first before like years later, you find the primary tumor then, oh, it is actually in the, in the ileum. Um, but the patient had many years back Cushing syndrome and complained of weight gain over 10 years, developing um, a red face, developing high blood pressure, diabetes, and uh, basically metabolic syndrome features, which, you know, could be missed. If you just say, well, that's metabolic syndrome, the patient is obese, and that's, uh, that's all that it is. But it could um, hide, I mean, behind all this and that securable situation could be a neuroendocrine tumor um, that, that Dr. Reddy, our surgeon on the team here, would remove and then the case is uh, closed, <laughs> hopefully. Um, so <clears throat> that's what I would say um, for the hormone field. Um, you know, I would, you know, try to raise awareness and I give back to Dr. Nina. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Coach. I really appreciate it. Last but not the least, I want to introduce Anjali Alkanis, our social worker. Thank you, Dr. Vijay, and thank you to all of you who are joining us this evening. As Dr. Vijay said, my name is Anjali Albanese, and I'm one of the social workers here. And as you have heard from all the amazing professionals that have spoken before me, we truly do take a multidisciplinary approach to your care. And part of that is you know, really making sure that we're paying attention to your emotional needs as well as your physical needs. We truly recognize that you were a unique and individual person before you came through our doors. And our hope is to really pay attention to that and focus in on what we can do to help support you and to get you through this experience. Part of my role is to be able to provide emotional support to our patients and to their support systems. We recognize that every, to everyone, this could mean something different. I have some patients that call me and they like to talk to me weekly. I have other patients that call when they need something. I have some patients that just ask me to stop by when they're there just so they have a familiar face that they can see. We also understand that cancer doesn't just affect us emotionally or physically. It also sometimes affects all these other aspects of our lives. Sometimes it affects work. It affects how we talk to our family members or to our friends or to our children about the disease. Um, sometimes it's, you know, just sort of getting a better understanding of what this means for us and what these changes can feel like, and then how to communicate our needs and wants to the people that love us. And social work can help with all of those things. 
We have resources that can help with finances because we understand that oftentimes work um, is something that we really have to think about how to juggle work and coming in for treatments and appointments. And then we also have um, community resources that we can refer patients to because we recognize that sometimes coming back and forth to the hospital can be very challenging and very draining. And we know that you know sometimes it's nice just to choose to do something that might be closer to home. And so we can really help link you up to those resources as well. When we do things like provide support or make referrals to community resources, we really do pay attention to what your needs are and what resources or what services we can provide that would best meet those needs for you. One of the things that we're working on right now is to provide a support group to people because we understand that sometimes it, this can feel very isolating. You know, as you've heard from the other physicians that have spoken, it can be a rare cancer. And so sometimes people feel like, you know, am I the only person going through this? Or, you know, am I, am I, what I, is what I'm feeling normal? And so we're working currently on establishing a support group so that people have a network of other people that are going through something similar in the hopes that everybody can come together and support one another. I'm truly lucky to work with such an amazing group of people. And I also just wanna remind all of you that you, we are more than happy to become part of your team and to be here to support you and help you in any way possible. If there's ever anything we can do, please don't ever hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, sincerely appreciate that. So Lat, in the end, one thing I also want to mention, you know, I am the medical oncologist, you've heard from different parts, you know, there are a lot of new medical therapies that are um, coming up or are available for neuroendocrine tumors, the chemotherapy for the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors to a lot of targeted agents. Um, we talked about the PRRT and its new versions 2.0 and 3.0 that will be coming in the future. The biggest question that a lot of times that we all face or patients are gripe with is which treatment to go with. You know, what is the right sequencing of these all these different treatment options that are you know, can be overwhelming to make those decisions. And, and a multidisciplinary input is extremely valuable for that. And you know, we have a tumor boards where we discuss all our patients and come up with a plan where all of us, and you know, including GI, who's not represented here today because of some conflict, but all of us. And we talk together and make a plan that's befitting the patient, you know, like a tailored approach just for our patients. And that is something you really want for a good treatment for neuroendocrine tumors. We offer, um, you know, the only way forward is to, is doing research. And you know, because we are good, but we're not that we're not there yet. We still have a long way to go for these cancers. So we offer a ton of clinical trials for our patients and. I myself am involved in a lot of them. I have written some studies for high-grade neuroendocrine cancer that we've done here um, and published, and we are currently ongoing studies that we have for our patients. So please inquire about these options with your doctors, and um, and, and we will be working very hard to um, make sure we, we make move the field forward and needle in the right direction as we move along. So with that, I am going to... Um, um, go over to the question and answer session. So if you haven't and you have a burning question in mind and haven't dropped it yet, please drop in a question in the chat feature on the Facebook. I do have a few questions that have come already. So I am going to blast away. Um, the first question that comes in is, um, is what is a tumor board? So I, you know, we all talk about that. We do most of disciplinary discussions. We talk in tumor boards. Uh, I, Dr. Reddy, would you like to explain to our for our listeners, what a tumor board really means. Sure. So, you know, a tumor board is probably one of the most pivotal things we do here at a cancer center. In a nutshell, it's it's a combination of just a lot of doctors sitting in one room or now maybe sharing multiple screens um, and discussing your case. You know, we know that with this disease, a lot of experts need to weigh in on the scenarios. And really what we do is we review the case, look at imaging, and we have input from five surgeons, five to 10 medical oncologists, a bunch of radiation doctors, GI docs, pathologists. And we really just dig down and we, we really delve into the case and the nitty gritty aspects of the case. And we all try to figure out a consensus. So essentially at the end of the case, we say, what is the overwhelming majority of people think we need to do? 
And then we use that and we bring that to the patient as the opinion. How many times do you feel, this is my question, that the tumor board actually helps you to make a decision rather than your personal opinion? Yeah, you know, in surgery, and in surgery in particular, it's hard to not have tunnel vision, right? And I think the input you get from the group really just takes off the blinders and it allows us to think, you know, systematically and really as objectively as possible to offer the best treatment. Because listen, as a surgeon, the first thing I want to do is try to cut it out, right? But sometimes it's not the best way to approach it. Sometimes we have to shrink things or change things and, and, and offer different modalities to get to that point. So I think it really does affect the way we treat patients. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. The next question is for IR, Dr. Abdullah. There's actually two questions. So you talked about the different embolization techniques. Uh, yeah. How do you decide which to use and which not to use? And the second question is a little specific about the role of ablation for pheochromocytomas. Okay. Um, I could start with the first question. So how do you, we decide which treatment to do? Um, Every treatment is very personalized to the patient. So it really depends on the size of the lesions. We review the imaging very carefully, the number of the lesions and the location of the lesions. A lot of times you also factor in the grade. So is it a low grade or high grade tumor? Um, for small size lesions that are few in number, ablation is really the preferred treatment option just because um, we have good data. Um, that can really support really getting rid of the lesions if they're small and few in number. For larger size lesions or lesions that are more numerous um, in the liver, embolization and arterial therapies are better because we can do a wider treatment area. Um, for some lesions, we have to factor in the location. So if they're in a riskier area, close to big vessels, close to the gallbladder, close to bowel, um, ablation may not necessarily be a good option for that. So even though it could be small, we'll, we would lean towards um, an embolization procedure. Um, and sometimes, like I mentioned before, combination treatments can be very powerful um, when we do both embolization and ablation. So it's all very, very personalized. Um, every patient gets what's unique, uh, like some, a unique treatment um, and what's really best for them. Um, with regards, to the second question, it's a little tougher, um, pheo, like treating pheochromocytomas. Um, the, a lot of times, like I mentioned before, our treatments are pretty well tolerated. Patients can be awake during the treatment. Um, for these, for treating the more active tumors, like a pheochromocytoma, there's a lot more planning involved. A lot of patient, times patients have to be on treatment a week before to suppress the hormones. During the treatment, we'll often have anesthesia support because we want to make sure the blood pressure is um, maintained um, during the procedure. And we'll often keep patients afterwards to make sure everything's okay with regards to blood pressure support. Um, sometimes patients need to be monitored in the ICU for those active tumors as well. So it's um, so although it can be done, it, it's a little riskier. So that's why um, we take all those precautions when we're doing those treatments. Thank you very much. But as to clarify, you can only do it on the liver or some tumors that are, that you probably cannot do it if this was just in the adrenal gland, if it was a medullary fear, correct? We can, um, yeah, we typically are treating tumors in the liver. So that's what I'm facing all my talking on. Although sometimes we can treat in other organs, it's more rare. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. The next question is for Dr. Yu. Um, Dr. And Dr. Yu, what are the potential risks of PRRT that we need to um, you know, weigh when we offer this effective treatment as you just mentioned? So the PRRT really, as Sanjay said, is a game changer. So in the past, we seldom use that for preoperative evaluation. So we can help the surgeon to identify the primary and the metastasis, and then just change the treatment. <laughs> and then, you need to know exactly what the physiological distribution should be because there are certain, you know, at the very beginning, we see the activity in the brain, people call for it. Eventually, we know that's a physiologic. And then there are some other locations could be physiologic uptake. That's need some expertise 
and then you need other diagnostic imaging like uh, CT or MR to really correlate. When we do PET CT, we have a CT, but usually it's a lower dose and it's usually for localization and attenuation correction. But I always look at the other diagnostic CT, MR, and other available imaging to give us a better idea. A lot of time we have to be mindful to say, hey, what the, we already have other imaging, what this PET CT can provide additional information. Thank you. Now, from my perspective, because I also see a lot of these patients, you know, I definitely counsel them about the fact that you know, we take all the precautions we can um, to make sure that you know, we are treating the right patient, selecting the right patient. But we, you know, there are always, there is no free lunch in medicine is how I call it. And you know, everything comes with its own baggage. There is some the small but real long-term risk associated with the, the blood counts and effect on the blood cells. You know, the kidney protection we have achieved with the use of a lot of um, uh, this protein solution that we give patients that Karen was talking about. There is also, um, a, a, you know, we talk about when the initial studies were done with PRRT, they used to use like a, a commercially available protein solution, which caused a lot of nausea, vomiting, very high you know, I remember treating patients with that solution in the beginning, and it was patients were miserable because of all the nausea that came with it. But now we have, you know, we have compounded the two most important classes that helped it. And those have been such a game changer. Most of my patients basically come back and tell me that I don't know why I was scared. This was like the easiest thing that I've been through, even better than the shot because the, the somatostatin analogs or the you know, the octreotide shots that we get definitely cause some pain, but this is much um, easier tolerated in the short term. But there are some long-term risks. There's, you know, some data about having, you know, can it cause blockages in the intestine and all these things we are learning about this new therapy. So it's very important to pick the right patient, which brings us to the next question. Who is the right patient for doing PRRT? versus doing liver-directed therapy or debulking. So, you know, again, these are all three things you use for this disease and which would be a best patient for one versus the other versus the third. So I'm gonna ask Dr. Reddy to talk about who does he think is the, I, you know, somebody who should be considered for surgery before any of the other procedures. Yeah, that's a great question. It actually brought me to one of my kind of last talking points really, you know, in, in pancreas cancer, for example, I'm a big believer of neoadjuvant therapy, right? So we use therapy to shrink tumors, to downstage things before I take them to surgery. I think in the era of neuroendocrine tumor, the future is going to be utilizing PRRT or neoadjuvant therapies, ablations as a combination to then offer surgery. So in my book, if I can resect something and I can get the surgical dogma is 90% of the disease out, it's reasonable to proceed with surgery. But in those instances where I'm not confident I can get all of it out, and I think utilizing these different techniques and tricks that we have to get to that point is the way to go. Thank you. And that brings, you know, Dr. Abdullah, what do you think about, you know, who's the ideal candidate for you know, approaches that target the liver interventionally? Yeah, I think um, kind of like what going off of what Sanjay said, I think having multiple disciplinary discussions and really trying to figure out which is best for each patient um, is important. For liver directed therapy, some of the things that are important that we factor in is the liver function. Um, since most of the treatment, um, we always try to target the tumor. Some of it does end up going to the background normal liver. So it's so we always have to consider that when we're treating um, doing liver directed therapies because we don't want to cause any kind of liver damage. Um, and the type of treatment that we choose um, is also important. So a lot of so sometimes we'll choose a more gentle treatment for the liver early on, um, like the bland embolization. And then if the tumor is more aggressive, we'll, we will um, do a more aggressive option like radio embolization. So every, like, again, kind of like the same theme, it's very personalized and different for everybody. And we always factor in the multidisciplinary discussion and kind of what the consensus is. Thank you. And Dr. Yu, for PRRT, 
like what are like the minimum requirements or at least these things are needed for so because we have the imaging we can definitely select the right patient so we'll definitely do the imaging before we make the decision if you only have one or two spot maybe surgery is the way to go and then if the patient is liver dominant disease or liver only disease maybe liver directed therapy is the way we like to treat patient with widely spread tumor all over the place because we can see them, our target will go to the same place. Also the uptake, because we have a physiological uptake in the liver, spleen and uh, other organs, the tumor uptake has to be higher than the liver, at least. If they are higher than the spleen, they are higher than all the physiological, even better because the tracer will concentrate in the tumor more than the physiological sites. Thank you. So yeah, so you know, activity on the gallium or the copper um, PET scans is very important to see. And that's how we will select that's the minimum requirement, having a good kidney function so you can flush out all the bad stuff out is definitely an important part of our um, evaluation process. But then the multidisciplinary discussion for someone who's eligible for oral free, which one should we do first? It's a very individualized you know, therapy option. Thank you. One question somebody brought up is what are the clinical trials that are available at Fox Chase for our patients? So I'm, I can go ahead and talk a little bit about that. We have, um, you know, we have done a few studies. We have role of immunotherapy in the patients who have sort of higher grade tumors. We've uh, published that uh, successfully. Unfortunately, it was a negative study. We currently have a study of using um, a, a new oral pill. It's called cabozantinib. And it's used in the in the neuroendocrine tumors of the GI tract, of pancreas, of the lung, for patients who have had, um, you know, who, who are not responding to the current treatment anymore. And then we also have uh, studies for patients who are poorly differentiated, high-grade neuroendocrine cancer using immunotherapy doublets and some new and new study that is um, there are a few of them that are coming on the horizon, hopefully opening up soon, using some novel targets and maybe using. Uh, PRRT sooner in or in patients with more aggressive disease. So, yes, we do have a ton of exciting things ongoing. The next question, uh, or the last question of the series that we have, and um, is Mommy. my son just came in to say hello to everyone, but he's uh, he's, uh, he's saying hello everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the last question that we wanted to ask and talk about is. I'm going to just ask everyone in one line sentence, what are you most hopeful for in the area of neuroendocrine tumors over the next five years? I'll start with um, Anjali. Uh, thanks, Dr. BJ. That's a great question. Um, I would say I'm the most hopeful that with all the um, progress that we're making, with all the new um, things that are on the horizon, that people really feel hopeful that they feel supported and that they feel cared for because that truly is our goal. Thank you. Karen? Um, I'm hopeful that um, the patients continue to have a, a good attitude about their treatment. And uh, most of them are so thankful that we offer this program at Fox Chase and that um, we continue to support them. And I'm looking forward to participating in the uh, support group that we're starting. What? Dr. Yu. I would like to have a new treatment, new tracer available or other kind of uh, new advancement. And then I'll make sure we have the new technology uh, advancement bring in the center early. Dr. Reddy? Well, for my take, I want it to be like a boxing match, right? I want to use each one of these different techniques and tips and tricks to beat this thing down. And then at the end of the day, the knockout punch, hopefully a surgery to get it out. So I'm hoping that in the future, that's the direction we're going. Dr. Abdullah. Um, one of the things I'm most proud of in IR is really to be able to treat patients um, and not cause a lot of pain. So make the treatments really well tolerated. Um, just so 
you know, create that comfort um, in order to, for patients to be able to continue to live their best life. Thank you. And I'll, the last is, I think our all our goal together is to make sure that we can move the needle forward and help our patients to the best of our abilities and, um, and do more research to get, you know, make this disease a thing of the past one day. <laughs> So thank you, everybody. This is all the time that we have. Thank you all for joining us and for taking your time. Thank you to the audience for listening, for the great questions you had. Thank you to our exhibitors and the advocacy, advocacy organizations for supporting. And um, so this concludes our Together Facing Cancer series for the fall. We will be announcing our spring topics in the new year. Please join us virtually for the Tree of Life celebration end of December. Um, which is December 15th, and you can check it out on our, on our website and our Facebook page. So thank you, everybody, and everyone have a great evening. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good night.